Um, good morning and welcome to the University of New South Wales Museum of Human Disease video conferencing series. Today I'm talking about blood and the circulatory system and I'm Jean-Luc Goh, a fifth year medical student with the Museum of Human Disease. So very briefly, this is an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. And although today I'm not talking about the heart, it is also very important to know that the heart plays a huge role in the circulatory system. So firstly, when we talk about blood, we have to ask ourselves, what form blood? And we can separate this into cellular and non-cellular components. Within the cellular component, we have the red blood cell, or in science we call them the erythrocyte. And one of the functions of red blood cells are to carry carbon dioxide and oxygen around the body for the purpose of removing carbon dioxide at the lung and for oxygen uptake in the tissues. The next cell is the white blood cell, or we call this the leukocyte. And the main function of white blood cells is to fend off infection, particularly bacterial, viral and parasitic infections. And lastly, not really a cell per se because they do not contain a nucleus but they are considered cellular fragments. We have the platelets and we call these thrombocytes, thrombus and cytes, so cells that actually are able to form a clot. Within the non-cellular components we have water, a couple of gases that are important such as carbon dioxide and oxygen which get transported within the blood, carbon dioxide to be um, ventilated out of the body and oxygen to be transported around the body. We have a couple of electrolytes, so sodium, potassium, calcium and bicarbonates which are very important with regards to physiological homeostasis. For example, sodium and potassium are required at proper concentrations for the heart to beat at a regular rate and bicarbonates are very important for the purpose of regulating the body's pH. Also, there are a couple of energy sources that get transported around via the bloodstream and these are basically fat, protein and carbohydrates. And you would know that in certain diseases we have patients who have a very high level of carbohydrates in the blood and we call this, patient, uh, we call this disease diabetes where the individual has a high glucose level. Lastly, the blood actually carries waste products that are produced by the tissue bed and the organs so that they can be excreted via certain organs. For example, ammonia or ammonium is produced by cells that are using up nutrients and at the same time has to be excreted by the kidneys. And there are other things within the bloodstream such as uh, clotting factors which are involved in the formation of um, thrombus within the body so that we do not bleed to death. So this is basically a picture of a cartoon of a blood vessel and what's within the blood vessel and very nicely the picture shows red blood cells, a couple of different white blood cells such as the neutrophils, um, macrophages, lymphocytes, so on and so forth and a very small non-cellular fragment, but we, call, we consider these cellular fragments, the platelets. And different white blood cells, such as the neutrophil, perform different functions. For example, the neutrophil are known to fend off bacterial infections, whereas the lymphocyte at the bottom right-hand side of the picture are known to fend off viral infections and also modulate the adaptive immune response. In clinical medicine, it is important for the doctors to know what kind of blood disorder the patient has. In addition to ordering standard blood tests, the physician may also look at what the blood cells look like under the film. And we call this the peripheral blood smear. What happens is a drop of the patient's blood gets put on a glass slide and it's smeared. And we look at the resultant smear under a light microscope. And what you can see here is a blood smear of a relatively normal individual. You see a lot of red blood cells 
with a central white circle and that is normal too much white is not good and if the red cells are too small that is also a problem but these red cells that we see here are all normal next if you look at the middle part of the screen you would see four interesting looking cells these cells are bigger than the red cell they possess more than one nucleus so they are multinucleated and these are the neutrophils that I've mentioned that fend off bacterial infections right and if you look specifically let's say at the top right hand side of the picture you would see very small circular cells or fragments in between the red blood cells and these are the platelets which are very important for allowing us to form a clot if we say fall over and cut ourselves this is a very close-up picture of what a red blood cell platelet and a particular white blood cell looks like if we really look very closely using what we call the scanning electron microscope to the left of the screen is a typical red blood cell where we can see at the center you have a concavity now this concavity appears on both sides moving on to the middle of the picture we see the cell which is the platelet which doesn't have a nucleus but very important in forming clots and these are very small cells and to the right hand side of the picture we see an example of a white blood cell and this is most probably the lymphocyte given its very spherical shape and lack of irregular margins lymphocytes as you would know play a very important role in in maintaining the adaptive arm of the immune system right so this brings me to the ends of the components of blood and now I'd like to spend some time talking about hemoglobin essentially this picture shows you that hemoglobin is a complex molecule it is a protein nonetheless which comprises of a couple of different chains and at the center of the hemoglobin you have an iron compound called heme which allows oxygen to bind so if you look at this picture what you can see is again four different protein chains and four separate iron containing inorganic molecules for the purpose of oxygen binding so in quick summary one of the most important functions in of hemoglobin is oxygen and carbon dioxide transport and last but not least hemoglobin is also involved in acid base balance to maintain the body's pH for the purpose of homeostasis to understand hemoglobin and to understand how adaptive the molecule is is reflected in this particular curve this curve is called the oxygen dissociation curve if we look at the y-axis it looks at how much or how many percent of hemoglobin is oxygenated if we look at the x-axis it basically tells us about the environment that particular hemoglobin molecule is, is exposed to so if we look at the right hand side of the curve we see that if we look at the corresponding x-axis which is let's say 80 millimeters of mercury of oxygen we see that most of hemoglobin is oxygenated it actually holds on to oxygen which makes sense for example in the lungs where the partial pressure of oxygen oxygen is very high hemoglobin would actually hold on to oxygen and not let it go which makes a lot of sense as we proceed towards the left hand side of the curve we see a huge dip and if we actually go down to 30 millimeters of mercury partial pressure of oxygen we see that the corresponding percentage of oxygen saturation is about 45 percent which means that in an environment of low oxygen saturation or oxygen content hemoglobin would actually release oxygen and this makes perfect sense so in summary this curve basically tells us in an environment with high oxygen content let's say the lungs hemoglobin would pick up the oxygen and not let it go whereas in an environment where there's low oxygen concentration hemoglobin would actually give out and release the oxygen for the respiring tissues so if you look at the human circulation its main aim is basically to transport highly oxygenated blood from the left side of the heart specifically the left ventricle 
to all the organs and tissues in the human body. And they do so by way of specific vessels known as arteries. And arteries are basically tubes of different sizes, different thickness, and different caliber. As we proceed from the left ventricle of the heart to the tissues, the diameter of the lumen or the space where blood can flow through becomes smaller. And as you can see at the right hand side of the picture, when you get down to the level of the arterioles, you would see that the lumen or the total diameter of the blood vessel becomes smaller and thinner. It is at the level of the arterioles where blood gets shunted to different organs based on the demands of that organ. Now if you look at the middle of the picture, you see a particular vessel called capillaries. What is interesting about these capillaries is that it's thin, it is comprised of one layer, which I'll talk about later, and it's at the level of the capillaries where transport of oxygen from the blood vessels to the tissues occur. At the same time, transport of carbon dioxide from the tissues to the blood vessel also occurs. This is obviously facilitated by diffusion. Remember, at the, at the tissue bed, the oxygen content is very low, whereas in the blood vessel, the oxygen content is very high. And because of the partial pressure difference, you have diffusion of oxygen into the tissues. And again, at the tissue bed, you have a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and hence a diffusion of carbon dioxide from the tissues back into the vessel. And lastly, if we move to the left-hand side of the screen, we see the veins. Initially, blood gets drained into the smaller veins called venules and the bigger veins. And these veins are actually, although bigger compared to arteries, are thinner and these veins are the ones responsible to bring deoxygenated blood back to the right heart so that the right heart can pump deoxygenated blood back to the lung. And as they say, seeing is believing, this is a picture of what an artery and vein looks like under the light microscope. If you look at the top picture, that is basically an artery given the thickness of its vessel wall and also that the lumen is smaller than the vessel below it. And if you look at the vessel below the artery, that is typical of a vein where the wall is very thin, the lumen is very big and at the same time it seems to be quite collapsed and under the pressure of the um, corresponding artery. So essentially, I talked about the blood and the circulation. Again, blood can be seen or approached by classifying it, it into cellular and non-cellular components. I've talked about hemoglobin and its important functions and the oxygen dissociation curve, which allows hemoglobin to adapt to different parts of the human body based on different oxygen content. I've talked about the circulation with regards to the different types of blood vessels and functions of these vessels. So I would like to thank all of you for tuning in to the um, Museum of Human Disease video conferencing session. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions.